In the bustling halls of a work-for-hire studio, four ambitious developers labored in anonymity for eight long years. Despite their dedication, their names remained unseen in the credits of the games they helped create. But during the chaos of a global pandemic, they took the bold leap of breaking free from their parent studio to establish Black Salt Games, driven by a desire to create something with their names on it and that a few people would play. After crafting three prototypes, it was Dredge, a low-poly cosmic horror fishing adventure that captured their imagination, blending the serenity of fishing with the spine-tingling horror elements of Lovecraftian lore. They didn't expect much, hoping to sell 100,000 copies in a year, but their hard work paid off and they achieved that milestone within a mere 24 hours, marking the beginning of their journey from anonymity to acclaim and the birth of a new extraordinary studio in the gaming world. With a new studio created and the freedom to design their own games, the team ran into one major issue. What game was that going to be? The four decided to throw their ideas around and use their speedy work for hire skills to create three different prototypes, with a deadline of one week to finish all three and another week of playtesting. The first was a very ambitious RTS that the team felt was too risky. The second was a stealthy robot game that involved stealing, but they couldn't figure out how to scale it or even what direction it was going in. But the third one that performed the best was a fishing game called Dredge. As for how we decided to focus on Dredge as our first game, we selected it through a process of prototyping. We designed a few different games and created prototypes of all of them before getting people to playtest them and give us their honest feedback. From this feedback and our own internal discussions, we landed on the decision to take Dredge forward into full production. We place a lot of importance on playtesting at our studio, and this process helps give us confidence in our decisions. Dredge was Joel's concept and was inspired by a web browser game called Motherload, where players had to mine ore, sell their haul, upgrade, and repeat. Joel wanted to bridge this gameplay loop idea to a fishing game, as he loved fishing in other RPGs and in real life. The actual idea comes from the whole idea of fish. I grew up around fishing, did a little fishing, and enjoyed the fishing minigames and other games, and then wanting to combine that with some atmosphere and games that I really like. Really oppressive atmospheres like Paper Please and Frostpunk, where things happen and none of it is good. I was just wanting to bring that to a fishing game. This atmosphere that Joel spoke about is what really convinced his friends. Basically, what he sold us on is this kind of tag that we still sell Dredge on today, which is Lovecraftian fishing game. And as soon as he kind of said that, Lovecraft and fishing, it made sense, you know, because the sea is really messed up. There are things out there that, yeah, and also, you know, that you're out there at sea, that loneliness, that isolation kind of feeling, and all of the themes and the atmosphere that it all just made sense. So yeah, that was the spot. With their prototype chosen, the team gave themselves only two years to complete their cosmic horror fishing game. The original prototype of Dredge was vastly different from its final product. Their prototype had no free movement and was a top-down turn and grid-based game. Every time a player moved the boat, it would consume resources. The loop at this time was going fishing, coming back, selling what you had, but you would never make enough to pay for anything. So players would be forced to make the hard decisions like feeding their family or pay for heating. The isometric view was scrapped quite early on in its conception though, when Alex randomly decided to put the camera behind the boat and make the world 3D just because he wanted to try it out. The prototype also didn't include the engaging fishing mechanic that players grew to love, and instead players just held the button down and the fish were reeled into a simple inventory system that never contributed to the actual gameplay. Realizing that the current inventory system offered nothing to dredge, the team knew it needed an overhaul. It was Alex who had the inspiring idea to use a grid-based inventory system similar to Resident Evil 4, and using the boat's cargo was the key. It ensured players wouldn't get bored or make dredge too repetitious. The more fish a player caught, the harder the management would become, and players would have to make hard decisions on what to keep or not. This idea, while small, completely changed Dredge. It now had the added gameplay element of becoming an item management game, adding depth to the overall experience. In fact, this Tetris-style grid system was such a good idea that Black Salt decided to add the puzzle to the rock slabs and the shrine hidden throughout the game. Having two distinct gameplay elements was actually a goal Joel wanted in Dredge from the start. I personally really enjoy games that have two distinct halves to them, Games like Moonlighter, for example, where you switch between roguelite action and shot management, are really interesting to me, so combining two different elements was always a goal. Dredge appears to be a game about fishing on the surface, but underneath the real gameplay loop revolves around time. Like previously mentioned, the prototype included fuel and the team could never really figure out how to make it feel important. We added fuel to the prototype, and there were a few different thoughts behind it. One was that players should have to push a refuel button every time they visit a dock. But when they did that, it felt like a nothing transaction because fuel was really cheap. But if you forgot to push it, that sucked. 
Alternatively, we could have made the refueling automatic, but that made the mechanic feel irrelevant until the part where you actually run out of fuel on the water. And we said, well, we're not gonna kill the player for that. So let's just make them move really slowly. That also didn't feel good, but we still wanted players to feel the excitement of being caught out at night. So that's why time became the resource instead. Everything in the game from moving and upgrading your boat causes time to move. The only way to stop time is for players to stop moving. And the only time players really stopped moving in Dredge was to fish. But Dredge still had a lackluster fishing mechanic. To fix this, the team decided to transform fishing into a simple minigame itself that not only made Dredge more engaging, but also rewarded players with quicker catches so they could get more done and avoid the night if they wanted to. I'm a huge fan of Stardew Valley and everything about that game except perhaps the fishing. It's just too finicky and frustrating and it removes me from the experience. That's why one of our core pillars was that the fishing minigame in Dredge must be optional. As you start the minigame, you're already catching the fish, whether you're pushing any buttons or not. It's just happening. And you can either help it along or potentially hinder it if you mess up that skill check. But if you do nothing, it'll still complete itself. It adds a bit of risk reward while keeping fishing fairly accessible. And making sure Dredge wasn't a skill-based fishing sim was a high priority for the team. It was also really important to us that there wasn't a skill check to stop players from engaging in the fishing. Yes, you can time button inputs to speed up the process, but unlike in real life, we wanted to make sure everyone would have that really satisfying feeling of eventually reeling in a fish. We also added additional accessibility options to remove penalties from things like missed time button inputs so that we could ensure everyone could enjoy the fishing no matter their situation or skill level. With Black Salt looking at the game loop of go out, get fish, sell, upgrade, go out, get caught at night, the team needed to create its Lovecraftian horror elements to begin fully bringing Dredge to life. Dredge's daytime is very colorful and bright, but when night comes, the color is washed out and the ocean transforms into a horrifying claustrophobic experience as the fog rolls in. Players can only see their boat in the immediate area around them, letting players' minds do the rest. As you travel around, you're spending your time pushing towards that time of day when things get harder, basically. I think the tension probably comes from the unknown and the deliberate freakiness that we've thrown at the game. We hold a lot back and let players imagine things a lot of the time. Fog plays a huge part in that, and from the very start it was one of the things that influenced a lot of the technical aspects that we had to do so that you could still see the boat. You can see for miles in the daytime, but view distance is very short during the night, which makes things very unsettling. The fog wasn't the only technique the team used to create tension within Dredge. There was also the panic meter. This meter is a visual representation of the fisherman's current mental state and will completely change the game at night. The more the fisherman is panicked, from not sleeping or sailing through red mist, the more weird things start to happen, such as hearing strange sounds, seeing unusual things in the fog, hearing gurgling and roaring around you, and even ghostly ships. While players would assumingly be afraid to go out at night, the team needed a reason to tempt players to go out in such horrifying conditions. And that reason was, certain and more valuable fish can only be caught at night. But while keeping true to their accessibility, the game wouldn't punish you for not venturing out at night. We always want people to feel unnerved, but we deliberately let people not go out at night if that's what they want. They can choose that balance for themselves. That said, there are more lucrative things that can be caught at night, and it can be easier to spot something at night. But we don't want to punish players who aren't brave enough to go out at night. But not fishing at night, players would miss out on the truly unique fish that exist in Dredge's world, and that lead artist Alex and 3D artist Michael spent a ton of time working on, creating over a hundred fish and a few monsters that lurked underneath the sea. While some were easier to model since they exist in real life, others, like the aberrations, needed a bit of research and experimentation. What's like something I don't expect with this fish? I'm going to try that out and see if it works. There are a lot of messed up things in the real world. I was looking for things and thought, that's a really messed up anglerfish. And that's a really messed up blobfish. Once we started getting a little bit more into the lore, I started looking at Lovecraftian creatures. And they are an undefined mass of monstrosity. While Alex worked on the fish, Michael created the monsters that haunt players within Dredge, with the goal of each monster being unique from the others. Each of the different zones in Dredge has its own unique biome and we wanted each of these areas to have a monster or obstacle that inhabited it, that would, more often than not, actively look to impede your journey. Once we locked in what we wanted for the environment, we could then start planning what these monsters would try to do to the player. We would drop ideas on a whiteboard and plan out gameplay objectives for each area, then ideate around possibilities to hinder the player. This process allowed us to lay the foundation for each monster's behavior and create immersive environments where the player would feel constantly challenged by their surroundings. And if either Alex or Michael had issues with coming up with a concept, the team was always there to help them. 
If things were vague from the start, I'd do some rough and ugly sketches in Photoshop and ask the rest of the team which ones resonated with them. Usually the idea that I was probably the most dismissive of was the one they ended up liking the most. So figuring out how to blend those things together was probably the most enjoyable part of the whole process. And when Michael finished the design of one of these monsters, he and Joel would work together to animate it. Once everything was set up, I'd create a set of different animations and collaborate with our programmer Joel to bring them to life. We'd usually spend a bit of time trying to set things up so they could be tested in the context of the full game. And this is where I'd usually discover that I needed to add or change existing animations depending on what we felt would make things more interesting or possible for that matter. Getting things tested was most important to fine tune the experience we wanted players to have. And there were definitely a few times when we would have to change up the environment and our creature behavior to really bring to life the scenarios we had in mind. And only a few monsters actually stayed true to their original design, and some monster concepts were cut entirely. Some concepts and ideas sounded great in theory, but then we blocked them out in the game and realized, oh, the water is too shallow for something like this. Or the environment made it harder for the monster to chase you down without smashing into everything when it turned a corner. The way things appear underwater or at night also played a big part when it came to iterating on the design of the creature. We had to balance things looking and behaving in an interesting way, within the limitations of our scope and platform. While the team were developing these unique monsters, they actually influenced the entirety of Judge's gameplay in another way, abilities. When creating the monster for Twisted Strand, for example, the idea for it was a monster that would charge at players. The team's idea to combat this was a harpoon gun, and while it was initially a good idea, the team realized the complexity of making it work, and then soon realized that it could ruin the entire game. The Twisted Strand was going to have a monster that would charge players, and players would have to use a harpoon gun to shoot it. Issue was the harpoon gun would have been first person, and it was not easy to implement this design into the game, especially with rough seas. We thought about doing some auto-aiming thing where you just had to be close to the monster to use the harpoon, or maybe even attach it to the broad side of the boat so that it could auto-fire. There were other issues around the harpoon, because now players have access to a gun. So what are they going to harpoon? There's obviously a whale that shows up in the game, so they're going to run around and start trying to shoot the whale or they'll go to another location and start trying to shoot the town. They'll just shoot things that they're not supposed to and it'll break the immersion of the game, especially when the world doesn't react back. But in the end, Dredge was a puzzle game and the team didn't want to change genres into an FPS, even if it was just for a moment. With the harpoon gun idea not working out, the team changed philosophies on their next abilities and figured out how to incorporate them into Dredge's gameplay loop. We wanted to make sure that our abilities, those things that you can unlock in every zone, weren't just one-trick ponies. We wanted them to be useful in every zone. That's why, for example, the dynamite players eventually unlock can be used across the entire map to unblock routes, shortcuts, and secret areas that might be previously been inaccessible. It also encourages players to revisit zones after they completed their respective questline to see what they missed last time around. That, in turn, feeds into the title's underlying time management mechanic as each of those longer journeys to the larger zones will consume more daylight, increasing the risk of players being caught out at night and encountering all manners of unsavory creatures that could bring about wreck and ruin. Along with abilities, one of the main gameplay pillars were upgrades. The upgrade and research trees really came from the RPG side of our game design. We also wanted to make sure it was really accessible and tried to avoid adding any unnecessary grind so players wouldn't be removed from the story by having to deal with unnecessary progression gates. With the money the players received from selling their fish and the unique items they could find, players could upgrade their boat with new lights, increase speed with engine upgrades, increase cargo space, and even upgrade rods to catch new fish and catch them quicker. These were added to give the players a feeling of progression and power. Although, in the early stages, the devs might have accidentally gave the players too much power. In the beginning, they experimented with the idea of the ocean waves that would slowly move the boat. But this idea did not work with the time element, as a freely moving boat would cause too many issues with it. We decided early on that we didn't want the water physics to move the boat, because the location of the player in the world should result from the choice players make in relation to their time resource. So we didn't want you to just be able to sort of float everywhere for free in a way. This problem took them months to figure out, because they realized when the boat was upgraded enough, the waves began to turn boats into missiles. The combination of particularly steep waves and a boat that had a decent number of upgrade engines could result in a ramp. So there was a time where if you were going fast enough, you could actually fly. You would get enough lift, and then of course you'd land again and sink down to the bottom of the ocean and bounce around. But using their skills, the team was able to figure out a solution to stop players from thinking they were playing Tony Hawk's Pro Skater. We had to figure out how much damping to put on the speed of the boat to make it so that when players encounter bigger waves, they're slowed down even more. 
We also have a whole system for painting the wave height in the world. So whenever you're near an island, we have a texture that controls the maximum possible wave height. It's always set to zero at the edge of the islands, so that the waves can't lift the boat up and beach players. We ended up just going with a simple sine wave shape. And visually, that was only slightly different anyway. Technically, you could say they look less realistic, but our game isn't realistic. And the gameplay was much better for the change. While figuring out the waves took some time to get right, creating the map itself was another hurdle for Black Salt. They spent many hours in front of a whiteboard discussing what they hoped Dredge's world would be. In the end, they decided on a map that would be big enough that if players didn't upgrade their boat, places would be difficult to reach. Players aren't restricted on where they can explore in Dredge. We allow players to go anywhere, anytime. But there are areas that are more difficult to access if you don't upgrade your boat. Ports have been placed just far enough away that you can't do it all in one trip. Alex spent eight months creating the first zone of the game, the Temperament Force Archipelagio the Maros. It was quite the task to find the right balance of pacing they wanted for the entire game. But when they figured it out, Gale Cliffs, Stellar Basin, Twisted Strand, and Devil's Spine were easier to complete, only taking about one to two months to finish. With a world to explore now, the team felt fishing needed to be scaled up to give players the ability to explore and not miss out on a big portion of the game. The answer they came up with were crab pots and trial nets, which players could leave in the ocean and collect their rewards while exploring. While these seemed like obvious choices, these items were not something the team had even considered before until they realized the full scope of Dredge. While Black Salt were very talented game developers, there was one area where they knew they struggled in, marketing. We don't know anything about how to get the game out. We can make a game, but we don't know how to sell a game. So the team attempted to find the perfect publisher that would help them achieve their goals of getting Dredge to as many people as possible. Because we were in the situation where we had the development funding paid for, but what we were looking for was a partner who could really be able to elevate us and share us widely as possible. Yet, Black Salt were not very optimistic of actually getting one. But what caught the eye of one publisher was when the team began posting on Twitter, and the simple dredge banner caught the eye of a Team 17 scout. So pretty much as soon as we had, you know, kind of anything to show about dredge, we started posting it out on Twitter. And immediately, one of their publishing scouts at the time, Simon Smith, reached out to us and we were like, we're not ready. Not an offer, I don't think. He was ready to see what we had. And then it took us about six months to put together a publisher demo. And then at that point, we sent it to Team 17. Although Team 17 did reach out, the team wasn't sure they were a good fit for them, as Dredge was a slower paced horror game and weren't sure that it would fit with Team 17's more action-y games in their portfolio. But Team 17 did surprise them and made an offer to support their cosmic horror fishing game. Our aim in partnering with a publisher was to be able to share Dredge wider than we could have managed ourselves. More languages than the single one we speak, more platforms than the two we can manage in-house, and generally just getting the game out there and in front of people via shows and games media. We felt that Team 17 were going to best be able to support those goals of ours. Dredge originally had little to no story within the game during the first few months. This was mostly down to having no writer. But when the playtesters began diving into the game, their interests were piqued, and they wanted to know more about what was going on. Yeah, so it came from Joel, who was our programmer and writer, it turns out. Yeah, we didn't really plan for it to be so narrative heavy when we were first building Dredge. I think, you know, we started with maybe 10,000 words. That turned into 30, 35,000. Yeah, so it evolved as we went along. Joel also ended up writing every single fish description in the game, making them as edgy and over the top as possible, as it became his favorite creative part of making the game. Arguably, the most important aspect of Dredge was its graphics, though. Alex noticed that the low poly graphics in the prototype worked extremely well bringing the horror to life in Dredge. His inspiration for Dredge's graphics came from his love of the painted abstract look of Disco Elysium, and the portraits and concept art of Dishonored, especially how the art is focused on the face and becomes more abstract outside the focus. That's why the fisherman portrait Alex first drew locked in the look for Dredge. This style worked in favor for Dredge because even though everything was simple and vague, this let players' minds fill in the rest, something the team called implied horror. This meant that even though Dredge is quite simple in looks, players' minds would imagine more detail in the game than there actually was. That wasn't to say there wasn't detail in Dredge. In fact, Alex used geometry-based low-poly graphics, keeping the edges sharp, which gave everything in Dredge more detail than originally meets the eye, especially with the Lovecraftian monsters that lurked under the sea. Since we used geometry to help texture some of our assets rather than relying on texturing everything by hand, some things in the game are actually more detailed than they seem. This technique has its own drawbacks, but we needed it to achieve the art style we were after, especially for some of the larger creatures in the game. 
The final six months of Dredge's two-year development were spent on polishing the game, adding in the quest, and putting the final touches on. One of those additions were more variations in the fishing minigame, as Dredge almost launched with just one variation. And in a somewhat rare occurrence in the gaming world, Black Salt Games never had the crunch to finish Dredge, and they credit this for a variety of reasons, from their small team to even the graphics. We get to move pretty quickly like if we want to change direction or try something new. Another benefit is that there's less heads talking in a room at any given time, so we can make design decisions a lot quicker. If we had chosen to do something with more detail or fully 3D characters, it would have taken a lot more time, but I'm still really happy with how it looks. And when you consider how much time it actually takes to make an asset versus how good it looks in the final product, I think it worked out quite well. But the team did admit that splitting the task between four of them was quite difficult, but their ability to plan ahead is what greatly helped. The challenge is how much we can achieve within the hours we have in the day. We try to be really careful about keeping the scope of the game manageable, not making it into a 10-year project. We knew that for one thing to happen, we might have to pull something away in another area, so we knew how to stay on track. Dredge released on March 30th and took the gaming world by storm, with the tiny Black Salt team reaching their sailing goal in a single day. We hoped to maybe sell 100,000 copies in our first year. That would have been amazing. That was a top estimate when we were setting our expectations. We smashed through those targets. The best part about reaching this milestone was the team was celebrating their launch party on a boat, watching the sails go up and up. We actually had our launch party on a boat, and we were just refreshing the sales page going, oh my god, oh my god. The whole idea was just to see if we can actually make a game that gets out there and is played by a few people. To see it go as crazy as it has, it's been pretty awesome. While the team was not expecting the sales Dredge has achieved, each one had the reasons why they think it was so successful. Having the day and night cycle really helps keep things fresh. And having the ability to pick up and choose what you want to spend your time doing, whether that's progressing the story, upgrading your boat, or just doing some good old fishing, we think, really gives the game longevity and broadens its appeal to all different types of players. I have a feeling that what helped us with Dredge was partly the premise being intriguing, but then also when you get into the game, it's usually not exactly what you expected. We could have gone down the rabbit hole of fishing mechanics like bait types, lures, and more involved fishing minigame, with line tension, etc. But instead, we used fishing mostly as a theme, focusing on time management, exploration, and upgrading, which are probably broader and more accessible. I think that's why we got a lot of comments from people who enjoyed Dredge, saying they never thought they'd enjoyed a fishing game. There are a lot of reasons I can think of though. It's hard to know which have the largest impact. Firstly, I think the game looks gorgeous, and that's thanks to our two extremely talented artists. Secondly, the blend of genres is enough to pique the interest of a wide range of players, and we get a lot of attention from both cozy and horror audiences. There are other theories I have, like the fact that we try to respect players' intelligence as much as possible by going light on tutorials and leaving them to discover how our mechanics work. I also think our very light approach to storytelling helps keep the game moving at a decent pace, while still allowing players to dive deeper if they want to. I like to think players appreciate these things, because they were deliberate decisions made by us. But who knows? By October of 2023, Dredge made the milestone of selling over 1 million copies, 10 times the amount that Black Salt thought they would get in a year. Their decision to make a simple fishing game with horror elements has skyrocketed their studio to heights they never thought they would reach. And that hasn't been taken for granted by the studio, as they look to continue giving fans more dredge for their support. We want to do right by the people. Originally, we were planning to do a few free updates and that's it. But because it's done so well, we can't just not do it for all the people. They are all wanting more. We should. If you enjoyed this detailed development story, click on this video here, as you'll enjoy this one as well.